The Colour of Magic by Terry Pratchett The podcast versions of the original Facebook live readings by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit Please bear in mind, as usual, that these are live recordings so there are the odd fluff here and there, the odd stumble and quite often laughter as the reader appreciates the humour along with you, the listener. Don't forget to like, share, and make sure that absolutely everybody you know that might like this is aware of these recordings. Thanks very much. Before we start, I would ask you to go over to patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit and become a patron of the podcast. This podcast is only possible uh, because of the generosity of my patrons. You can become a patron from as little as $5 a month, which is the price of a, a good cup of coffee or, or even a bad cup of coffee in some places. Um, but that does mean that I'm able to keep recording this material uh, and get it out there for you as soon as possible after broadcast on Facebook. So the link is patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit. $5 a month makes all the difference in the world to me. I'd like to thank all of the patrons that have supported me so far, and I hope the new patrons will enjoy what I do as much as everyone else does. Thanks very much. Now then, sit back, put your feet up, and enjoy the reading. Part 3 Quick recap. We are basically uh, a fair way into the book now. We have established the characters of Rince Flower and Two Flower. Sorry, Rince Wind and Two Flower. Uh, we've met the, uh, the patrician uh, and we have begun to understand that Two Flower is both naive, extremely wealthy by Ankh-Morpork-ian standards, uh, potentially um, likely to create a diplomatic incident because the Agatean Empire don't like the idea of their people uh, just wandering off doing whatever the hell they want. Uh, and they put a lot of pressure on the patrician to make sure that nothing untoward happens to Two Flower. So Two Flower is now bumbling around in this haze of naivety, having the time of his life. He's, he's survived vastly more by luck than any kind of judgment a tavern brawl. Uh, and Rincewind has just realised that basically he's got no option other than to try and keep this guy alive and try and find a way from escaping his responsibilities, which he will do at the earliest possible opportunity, I'm sure. But that's where we're at. Let us crack on. In the long afternoon, they toured the city turnwise of the river. Two Flower led the way with his strange picture box slung on a strap around his neck. Rincewind trailed behind, whimpering at intervals and checking in to see that his head was still there. A few others followed, too. In a city where public executions, duels, fights, magical feuds and strange events regularly punctuated the daily round, the inhabitants had brought the profession of interested bystander to a peak of perfection. They were, to a man, highly skilled gawpers. In any case, Two Flower was delightedly taking picture after picture of people engaged in what he described as typical activities, and since a quarter Rainu would subsequently change would subsequently change hands for their trouble, a tale of bemused and happy nouveau riche was soon following him in case this madman exploded in a shower of gold. At the temple of the seven-handed sec, a hasty convocation of priests and a ritual heart transplant artisans agreed that the hundred-span-high statue of Sek was altogether too holy to be made into a magic picture. But a payment of two Rainu left them astoundedly agreeing that perhaps he wasn't as holy as all that. A prolonged session at the whore pits produced a number of colourful and instructive pictures a number of which Rincewind concealed about his person for detailed perusal in private. As the fumes cleared from his brain, he began to speculate seriously as to how the iconograph worked. Even a failed wizard knew that some substances were sensitive to light. 
Perhaps the glass plates were treated by some arcane process that froze the light that passed through them. Something like that, anyway. Rincewind often suspected that there was something somewhere that there was better than magic. He was usually disappointed. However, he soon took every opportunity to operate the box. Two Flower was only too pleased to allow this, since that enabled the little man to appear in his own pictures. It was at this point that Rincewind noticed that something strange was going on. Possession of the box conferred a kind of power on the wielder, which was that anyone confronted with the hypnotic glass eye would submissively obey the most peremptory orders about stance and expression. It was while he was thus engaged in the plaza of broken moons that disaster struck. Twoflower had posed alongside a bewildered charm seller, his crowd of new-found admirers watching him with interest in case he did something humorously lunatic. Rincewind got down on one knee, the better to arrange the picture, and pressed the enchanted lever. The box said, It's no good, I've run out of ink. No, I've run out of pink. A hitherto unnoticed door opened in front of his eyes. A small, green, and hideously warty humanoid figure leaned out, pointed at a colour-encrusted palette in one clawed hand, and screamed at him. No pink! See? screeched the homunculus. No good you going on pressing the lever when there's no pink, is there? If you wanted pink, you shouldn't have took all those pictures of young ladies, should you? It's monochrome from now on, friend, all right? All, all right, uh, yeah, sure, said Rincewind. In one dim corner of the little box, he thought he could see an easel and a tiny unmade bed. He hoped he couldn't. So long as that's understood, said the imp, and shut the door. Rincewind thought he could hear the muffled sound of grumbling and the scrape of a stool being dragged across the floor. Two flower, he began, and looked up. Two flower had vanished. As Rincewinds stared at the crowd, with sensations of prickly horror travelling up his spine, there came a gentle prod in the small of his back. Turn without haste, said a voice like black silk, or kiss your kidneys goodbye. The crowd watched with interest. It was turning out to be quite a good day. Rincewind turned slowly, feeling the point of the sword scrape along his ribs. At the other end of the blade he recognised Stren Withel, thief, cruel swordsman, disgruntled contender for the title of worst man in the world. Hi, he said weakly. A few yards away he noticed a couple of unsympathetic men raising the lid of the luggage and pointing excitedly at the bags of gold. Withel smiled. It made an unnerving effect on his scar-crossed face. I know you, he said. A gutter wizard. What is that thing? Rincewind became aware that the luggage, the lid of the luggage, was trembling slightly, although there was no wind, and he was still holding the picture box. This. It makes pictures, he said brightly. Hey, you just hold that smile, will you? 
he backed away and quickly pointed the box. For a moment, Withal hesitated. What? he said. No, that's fine. Hold it just like that, said Rincewind. The thief paused and then growled and swung his sword back. There was a snap and a duet of horrible screams. Rincewind didn't glance round for fear of the terrible things he might see, and by the time Withal looked for him again, he was on the other side of the plaza, still accelerating. The albatross descended in wide, slow sweeps that ended in an undignified flurry of feathers and a thump as it landed heavily on its platform in the patrician's bird garden. The custodian of the birds, dozing in the sun and hardly expecting a long-distance message so soon after this morning's arrival, jerked his feet and looked up. A few moments later, he was scuttling through the palace's corridors, holding the message capsule and, owing to carelessness brought on by surprise, sucking at the nasty beak wound on the back of his hand. Rincewind pounded down an alley, paying no heed to the screams of rage coming from the picture box, and cleared a high wall with his frayed robe flapping around him like the feathers of a dishevelled dishevelled jackdaw. He landed in the forecourt of a carpet shop, scattering the merchandise and customers, dived through its rear exit, trailing apologies, skidded down another alley and stopped, teetering dangerously, just as he was about to plunge unthinkingly into the ank. There are said to be some mystic rivers, one drop of which can steal a man's life away. After its turbid passage through the Twin Cities, the Ankh could have been one of them. In the distance, the cries of rage took on a shrill note of terror. Rincewind looked around desperately for a boat, or a handhold up the sheer walls on other si either side of him. He was trapped. Unbidden, the spell welled up in his mind. It was perhaps untrue to say that he had learned it. It had learned him. The episode had led to his expulsion from the Unseen University because, for a bet, he had dared to open the pages of the last remaining copy of the creator's own grimoire, the Octavo, whilst the university librarian was otherwise engaged. The spell had leapt out of the page and instantly burrowed deeply into his mind, whence even the combined talents of the Faculty of Medicine had been unable to coax it. Precisely which one it was, they were also unable to ascertain, except that it was one of the eight basic spells that were intricately interwoven with the very fabric of time and space itself. Since then, it had been showing a worrying tendency, when Rincewind was feeling run down, or especially threatened, to try and get itself said. He clenched his teeth together, but the first syllable forced itself around the corner of his mouth. His left hand raised involuntarily, and, as the magical force whirled him around, began to give off octorine sparks. The luggage hurtled round the corner, its several hundred knees moving like pistons. Rincewind gaped. The spell died, unsaid. The box didn't appear to be hampered in any way by the ornamental rug draped roguishly over it, nor by the thief hanging by one arm from the lid. It 
was, in a very real sense, a dead weight. Further along the lid were the remains of two fingers, owner unknown. The luggage halted a few feet from the wizard, and after a moment retracted its legs. It had no eyes that Rincewind could see, but he was nevertheless sure that it was staring at him. Expectantly. Shoo, he said weakly. It didn't budge, but the lid creaked open, releasing the dead thief. Rincewind remembered about the gold. Presumably the box had to have a master. In the absence of two flower, had it adopted him? The tide was turning, and he could see debris drifting downstream in the yellow afternoon light towards the river gate, a mere hundred yards downstream. It was the work of a moment to let the dead thief join them. Even if it was found later, it could hardly cause comment. And the sharks in the estuary were used to solid, regular meals. Rincewind watched the body drift away and considered his next move. The luggage would probably float. All he had to do was wait until dusk and then go out with the tide. There were plenty of wild places downstream where he could wade ashore and then, well, if the patrician really had sent out word about him, then a change of clothing and a shave could take care of that. In any case, there were other lands, and he had a facility for languages. Let him but get to Chimera or Gonim or Ecaplon, and half a dozen armies couldn't bring him back. And then, wealth, comfort, security. There was, of course, the problem of two flower. Rincewind allowed himself a moment's sadness. It could be worse, he said by way of farewell. It could be me. It was when he tried to move that he found that his robe was caught on some obstruction. By craning his neck, he found that the edge of it was being gripped firmly, by the luggage's lid. Ah, Gorfal, said the patrician pleasantly. Come in, sit down. Can I press you to a candid starfish? I am yours to command, master, said the old man calmly, save perhaps in the matter of preserved echinoderms. The patrician shrugged and indicated the scroll on the table. Read that. Gorfal picked up the parchment and raised one eyebrow slightly when he saw that the familiar ideograms of the Golden Empire were there. He read in silence for perhaps a minute, and then turned the scroll over to examine minutely the seal on the obverse. "'You are famed as a student of empire affairs,' said the patrician. "'Can you explain this?' "'Knowledge in the matter of the empire lies less in noting particular events than in studying a certain cast of mind, said the old diplomat. The message is curious, yes, but not surprising. This morning, the emperor instructed, the patrician allowed himself the luxury of a scowl, instructed me, Gorfal, to protect this two-flower person. 
Now, it seems, I must have him killed. You don't find that surprising? No. The Emperor is no more than a boy. He is idealistic, keen, a god to his people, whereas this afternoon's letter is, unless I am very much mistaken, from nine turning mirrors, the Grand Vizier. He has grown old in the service of several emperors. He regards them as a necessary but tiresome ingredient in the successful running of the empire. He does not like things out of place. The empire was not built by allowing things to get out of place. That is his view. I begin to see, said the patrician. Quite so, Gorfal smiled into his beard. This tourist is a thing that is out of place. After acceding to his master's wishes, nine turning mirrors would, I am quite sure, make his own arrangements with a view to ensuring that one wanderer would not be allowed to return home bringing, perhaps, the disease of dissatisfaction. The Empire likes people to stay where it puts them. So much more convenient, then, if this two-flower disappears for good in the barbarian lands. Meaning here, master. And your advice, said the patrician. Gorfal shrugged. Merely that you should do nothing. Matters will undoubtedly resolve themselves. However, he scratched an ear thoughtfully. Perhaps the assassin's guild? Ah, yes, said the patrician. The Assassin's Guild. Who is their president at the moment? Oh, Zlorf Flannelfoot, master. Hmm. Have a word with him, would you? Quite so, master. The patrician nodded. It was all rather a relief. He agreed with nine turning mirrors. Life was difficult enough. People ought to stay where they were put. Slurp of tea. Oh, God. And this is the moment where I say I'm so English. God, I do love a good cup of tea. Right. Let us crack on. Brilliant constellations shone down on the disc world. One by one, the traders shuttered their shops. One by one... The gonoffs, thieves, fine wirers, whores, illusionists, backsliders, and second story men awoke and breakfasted. Wizards went about their polydimensional affairs. Tonight saw the conjunction of two powerful planets, and already the air over the magical quarter was hazy with early spells. Look, said Rincewind, this isn't getting us anywhere. He inched sideways. The luggage followed faithfully, lid half open and menacing. Rincewind briefly considered making a desperate leap to safety. The lid smacked 
in anticipation. In any case, he told himself with a sinking heart, the damn thing would only follow him again. It had that dogged look about it. Even if he managed to get a horse, he had a nasty suspicion that it would follow him at its own pace, endlessly, swimming rivers and oceans, gaining slowly every night while he had to stop to sleep. And then one day in some exotic city and years hence, he'd hear the sound of hundreds of tiny feet accelerating down the road toward him. You've got the wrong man, he moaned. It's not my fault. I didn't kidnap him. The box moved forward slightly. Now there was just a narrow slip of greasy jetty between Rincewind's heels and the river. A flash of precognition told him that the box would be able to swim faster than he could. He tried not to imagine what it would be like to drown in the ank. "'It won't stop until you give in, you know,' said a small voice conversationally. Rincewind looked down at the iconograph, still hanging around his neck. Its trapdoor was open, and the homunculus was leaning against the frame, smoking a pipe and watching the proceedings with amusement. "'I'll take you in with me at least,' said Rincewind through gritted teeth. The imp took the pipe out of his mouth. "'What did you say?' he said. "'I said I'll take you in with me, damn it. Suit yourself.' The amp, imp tapped the side of the box meaningfully. "'We'll see who sinks first. The luggage yawned and moved forward a fraction of an inch. Oh, all right, said Rincewind irritably, but you'll have to give me time to think. The luggage backed off slowly. Rincewind edged his way back onto reasonably safe land and sat down with his back against the wall. Across the river, the lights of Ankh City glowed. You're a wizard said the picture imp. You think of some way to find him? Not much of a wizard, I'm afraid. You can just jump down on everyone and turn them into worms, the imp added encouragingly, ignoring his last remark. No, turning to animals is an eighth level spell. I never even completed my training. I only know one spell. Well, that'll do. I doubt it said Rincewind hopelessly. What does it do, then? I can't tell you. I don't really want to talk about it. But frankly, he sighed, no spells are much good. It takes three months to commit even a simple one to memory, and then once you've used it, poof, it's gone. That's what's so stupid about the whole magic thing, actually, you know. You spend 20 years learning the spell that makes nude virgins appear in your bedroom, and then you're so poisoned by the quicksilver fumes and half-blind from reading old grimoires that you can't remember what happens next. Hmm. Never thought of it like that, said the imp. Hey, look, this is all wrong. When Two Flower said they'd got better kind of magic in the Empire, I, I thought, I thought... The imp looked at, him, looked at him expectantly. Rincewind cursed to himself. Well, if you must know, I thought he didn't mean magic, not as such. What else is there, then? Rincewind began to feel really wretched... I don't know, he said. A better way of doing things, I suppose. Something with a bit of bloody sense in it. Harnessing harnessing the lightning or something. The imp gave him a kind but pitying look. Lightning is the spears hurled, hurled by the thunder giants when they fight, he said gently. Established by meteorological fact. You can't harness it. 
I know, said Rincewind miserably. That's the flaw in the argument, of course. The imp nodded and disappeared into the depths of the iconograph. A few minutes later, Rincewind smelled bacon frying. He waited until his stomach couldn't stand the strain any more and rapped on the box. The imp reappeared. I've been thinking about what you said, it said before Rincewind could open his mouth, and even if you could get a harness on it, how could you get it to pull a cart? What the hell are you talking about? Lightning. It just goes up and down. You want it to go along, not up and down. Anyway, it would probably burn through the harness. I don't care about the lightning. How can I think on an empty stomach? Eat something, then. That's logic. How? Every time that damn box flexes its... Every time I move, that damn box flexes its hinges at me. The, cue, the luggage, on cue, gaped wildly. See? It's not trying to bite you, said the imp. There's food in there. You're no bloody use to it. starved. Rincewind peered into the dark recesses of the luggage. There were, indeed, among the chaos of boxes and bags of gold, several bottles and packages of oiled paper. He gave a cynical laugh, mooched around the abandoned jetty until he found a piece of wood about the right length, wedged it as politely as possible in the gap between the lid and the box, and pulled out one of those flat packages. It held biscuits that turned out to be as hard as diamond wood. Lovely. Hell, he muttered, nursing his teeth. Captain Eightpence's Traveller's Digestives, them, said the imp from the doorway of his box. Saved many a life at sea, they have. Oh, sure. Do you use them as a raft or just throw them to the sharks and sort of watch them sink? What's in the bottles? Poison? Water. But there's but there's water everywhere. Why do you want to bring water? Trust. Trust. Yes, that's what he didn't. The water, here, see? Rincewind opened a bottle. The liquid inside might have been water. It had a flat, empty flavour with no trace of life. Neither taste nor smell, he grumbled. The luggage gave a little creak, attracting his attention. With a lazy air of calculated menace, it shut its lid slowly, grinding Rincewind's impromptu wedge like a dry loaf. All right, all right, he said. I'm thinking. Emor's headquarters were in the Leaning Tower at the junction of Rhyme Street and Frost Alley. At midnight, the solitary guard leaning in the shadows looked up at the conjoining planets and wondered idly what change in his fortunes they might herald. There was the faintest of sounds, as of a gnat yawning. The guard glanced down in the deserted street and now caught the glimmer of moonlight on something lying in the mud a few yards away. He picked it up. The lunar light gleamed on gold, and his intake of breath was almost loud enough to echo down the alleyway. There was a slight sound again, and another coin rolled into the gutter on the other side of the street. By the time he'd picked it up, there was another one a little way off, still spinning. Gold was, he remembered, said to be formed from the crystallised light of stars. Until now, he'd never believed it to be true, that something as heavy as gold could fall naturally from the sky. As he drew level with the opposite alley mouth, some more fell. It was still in its bag, 
there was an awful lot of it. And Rincewind brought it down heavily onto his head. When the guard came round, he found himself looking up into the wild-eyed face of a wizard who was menacing his throat with a sword. In the darkness, too, something was gripping his leg. It was the disconcerting sort of grip that suggested that the gripper could get a grip a whole lot harder if he wanted to. "'Where is he, the rich foreigner?' hissed the wizard. "'Quickly!' "'What's holding my leg?' said the man, with a note of terror in his voice. He tried to wriggle free. The pressure increased. "'You wouldn't want to know,' said Rincewind. "'Pay attention, please. Where is the foreigner?' "'Not here. They've got him at Broadman's place. Everyone's looking for him. You're Rincewind, aren't you? The, the, bo the box at my... Sp oh, no, 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 please, please, please!' Rincewind had gone. The guard felt the unseen leg gripper release his, or, as he was beginning to fear, its hold. Then, as he tried to pull himself onto his feet, something big and heavy and square cannoned into him, out of the dark, and plunged off after the wizard. Something with hundreds of tiny feet. With only his homemade phrasebook to help him, Two Flower was trying to explain the mysteries of in sewer ants to Broadman. The fat innkeeper was listening intently, his little black eyes glittering. From the other end of the table, Emor watched with mild amusement, occasionally feeding one of his ravens with scraps from his plate. Beside him, Withel paced up and down. "'You fret too much,' said Emor, without taking his eyes from the two men opposite. "'I can feel it, Stren. Who would dare attack us here? "'And the gutter wizard will come. He's too much of a coward not to, "'and he'll try to bargain, and we shall have him and the gold and the chest.' "'Withel's one eye glared, and he smacked a fist into the palm of a black-gloved hand.' Who would have thought there was so much sapient pearwood in the whole of the disc, he said. How could he have known? You fret too much, Stren. I'm sure you can do better this time, said Emor pleasantly. The lieutenant snorted in disgust and strode off around the room to bully his men. Emor carried on watching the tourist. It was strange, but the little man didn't seem to realise the seriousness of his position. Emor had on several occasions seen him look around the room with an expression of deep satisfaction. He'd also been talking for ages to Broadman, and Emor had seen a piece of paper change hands. And Broadman had given the foreigner some coins. It was strange. When Broadman got up and waddled past Emor's chair, the thief master's arm shot out like a steel spring and grabbed the fat man by his apron. What was that all about, friend? asked Emor quietly. Nothing, Emor, just private business like. There are no secrets between friends, Broadman. Yeah, well, I'm not so sure about it myself, really. It's a sort of bet, see, the innkeeper said nervously. In sewer ants, it's called. It's like a bet that the broken drum won't get burned down. Emor held the man's gaze until Broadman twitched in fear and embarrassment. Then the thief master laughed. This worm-eaten old tinder pile, he said. <laughs> The man must be mad. Yes, but mad with money. He says now he's got the... I can't remember the word. Begins with a P. It's what you might call the stake money. The people he works for in the Agatean Empire will pay up if the broken drum burns down. Not that I hope that it does. 
The broken drum, I mean, I mean, it's like a home to me, it's the drum. Not entirely stupid, are you? said Emor, and pushed the innkeeper away. The door slammed back on its hinges and thudded into the wall. "'Hey, that's my door!' screamed Broadman. Then he realised who was standing at the top of the steps, and ducked behind the table a mere shaving of time before a short black dart sped across the room and thunked into the woodwork. Emor moved his hand carefully and poured out another flagon of beer. "'Won't you join me, Sloth?' he said levelly, and put that sword away, Stren. Zlorf Flannelford is our friend. The president of the Assassin's Guild spun his short blowgun dexterously and slotted it into its holster in one smooth movement. Stren, said Emor. The black-clad thief hissed and sheathed his sword, but he kept his hand on the hilt and his eyes on the assassin. That wasn't easy. Promotion in the Assassin's Guild was by competitive examination. The practical being the most important, indeed the only, part. Thus, Zlorf's broad, honest face was a welter of scar tissue, the result of many a close encounter. It probably hadn't been all that good-looking in any case. It was said that Zlorf had chosen a profession in which dark hoods, cloaks and nocturnal prowlings figured, figured largely because there was a day-fearing trollish streak in his parentage. People who said this in earshot of Zlorf tended to carry their ears home in their hats. He strolled down the stairs, followed by a number of assassins. When he was directly in front of the Emor, he said, I've come for the tourist. Is it any of your business, Zlorf? Yes. Grinjo, Ermond, take him. Two of the assassins stepped forwards. Then Stren was in front of them, his sword appearing to materialise an inch from their throats without having to pass through the intervening air. "'Possibly I could only kill one of you,' he murmured, "'but I suggest you ask yourselves which one.' "'Look up, Zlorf,' said Emor. A row of yellow, baleful eyes looked down from the darkness among the rafters. One step more, and you'll leave here with fewer eyeballs than you came in with, said the thief master. So sit down and have a drink, Zlorf, and let's talk about this sensibly. I thought we had an agreement. You don't rob, and I don't kill. Not for payment, that is, he added after a pause. Zlorf took the proffered beer. So, he said, I'll kill him, then you rob him. Is he that funny one sitting over there? Yes. Zlorf stared at Two Flower who grinned at him. He shrugged. He seldom wasted time wondering why people wanted other people dead. It was just a living. Who is your client, may I ask? said Emor. Zlorf held up a hand. Please, he protested. Professional etiquette. Of course. By the way, yes... I believe I have a couple of guards outside. Had. And some others in the doorway across the street? Formerly. And two bowmen on the roof. 
A flicker of doubt passed across Lorf's face, like the last shaft of sunlight over a badly ploughed field. The door flew open, badly damaging the assassin who was standing beside it. "'Stop doing that!' shrieked Broadman from under his table. Zlorf and Emor stared up at the figure on the threshold. It was short, fat, and richly dressed, very richly dressed. There were a number of tall, big shapes looming behind it, very big, threatening shapes. "'Who's that?' said Zlorf. "'I know him,' said Emor. "'His name's Rupf. "'He runs the groaning platter taffen down by Brassbridge. "'Stren, remove him!' Rep, re, le, "'Rupf held up a beringed hand. "'Stren Withel hesitated halfway to the door "'as several very large trolls ducked under the doorway "'and stood on either side of the fat man, blinking in the light.' Muscles the size of melons bulged in forearms like flour sacks. Each troll had a double-headed axe, between thumb and forefinger. Broadman erupted from cover, his face suffused with rays. Out! Out! he screamed. Get these trolls out of here! No one moved. The room was suddenly quiet. Broadman looked around quickly. It began to dawn on him just what he had said. And to whom? A whimper escaped from his lips, glad to be free. He reached the doorway to his cellars just as one of the trolls, with a lazy flick of one ham-sized hand, sent his axe whirling across the room. The slam of the door and its subsequent splitting as the axe hit it merged into one sound. Bloody hell, exclaimed Zlorf Flannelfoot. What do you want? said Emor. I am here on behalf of the Guild of Merchants and Traders said Rupf evenly, to protect our interests, you might say, meaning the little man. Emor wrinkled his brows. I'm sorry, he said. I thought I heard you say the Guild of Merchants. And traders, agreed Rupf. Behind him now, in addition to two more trolls, were several humans that Emor vaguely recognised. He had seen them, maybe, behind counters and bars. Shadowy figures, usually, easily ignored, easily forgotten. At the back of his mind, a bad feeling began to grow. He thought about how it might be, say, how a fox felt confronted with an angry sheep. A sheep, moreover, that could afford to employ wolves. How long has this guild been in existence, may I ask? Since this afternoon, said Rupp. I'm vice guildmaster in charge of tourism, you know. What is this tourism of which you speak? Uh, well, we're not quite sure, said Rupp. An old bearded man poked his head over the guildmaster's shoulder and cackled. Speaking on behalf of the wine cellars of Moorpork, tourism means business. See? Well, said Emor coldly. Well, said Rupp. We're protecting our interests, like I said. Thieves out! Thieves out! cackled his elderly companion. Several others took up the chant. Zlorf grinned. And assassins! 
chanted the old man. Zlorf growled. "'Stands to reason,' said Rupp. "'People robbing and murdering all over the place. "'What sort of impression are visitors going to take away? "'You come all the way to see our fine city "'with its many points of historical and civic interest, "'also many quaint customs, "'and you wake up dead in some back alley. "'Or, as it might be, floating down the ank. How are you going to tell all your friends what a great time you're having? Let's face it, you've got to move with the times. Zlorf and Imor met each other's gaze. We have, have we? said Imor. Then let us move, brother, agreed Zlorf. In one movement he brought his blowgun to his mouth and sent a dart hissing towards the nearest troll. It spun around, hurling its axe, which whirred over the assassin's head and buried itself in a luckless thief behind him. Rurp ducked, allowing a troll behind him to raise its huge iron crossbow and fire a spear-length quarrel into the nearest assassin. That was the start. It has been remarked before that those who are sensitive to radiations in the far octarine, the eighth colour, the pigment of the imagination, can see things that others cannot. Thus it was that Rincewind, hurrying through the crowded, flare-lit evening bazaars of Moorpork, with the luggage trundling behind him, jostled a tall, dark figure turned to deliver a few curses, and beheld death. It had to be death. No one else went around with empty eye sockets, and of course the scythe over one shoulder was another clue. As Rincewind stared in horror, a courting couple, laughing at some private joke, walked straight through the apparition, without appearing to notice it. Death, in so far it was possible in a face with no movable features, looked surprised. Rinse wind, Death said in tones as deep and heavy as the slamming of leaden doors far underground. Um said Rincewind, trying to back away from that eyeless stare. "'But why are you here?' Boom, boom, went cryptlids in the worm-haunted fastness under old mountains. "'Um, why not?' said Rincewind. "'Anyway, I I'm sure you've got lots to do, so if you'll just—' "'I was surprised that you jostled me, Rincewind, for I—' "'Have an appointment with thee this very night.' "'Oh, no, not, of course, what's so bloody vexing about the whole business "'is that I was expecting to meet thee in Siofafalpopolis.' "'But that's five hundred miles away.' "'You don't have to tell me. "'The whole system's got screwed up again, I can see that.' Look, there's no chance of you... Rincewind backed away, hands spreading protectively in front of him. The dried fish salesman on a nearby stall watched this madman with interest. Not a chance! I could lend you a very fast horse. No! It won't hurt a bit. No! Rincewind turned and ran. Death watched him go and shrugged bitterly. Sod you then, Death said. He turned and noticed the fish salesman. With a snarl, Death reached out a bony finger and stopped the man's heart. But he didn't take much pride in it. Then Death remembered what was due to happen later that night. It would 
not be true to say that death smiled, because in any case his features were perforce frozen in a calcareous, cal calcareous grin. But he hummed a little tune, cheery as a plague pit, and, pausing only to extract the life from a passing mayfly and one-ninth of the lives from a cat cowering under the fish stall, all cats can see into the octorine, death turned on his heel and set off towards the broken drum. And that's where we'll leave it for this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along and listening. Always a pleasure. Always, always, always a pleasure. <sighs> so, um, yeah, um, I'm not entirely sure if it's going to be this time next week. I'm going to try and get that sorted out, but I might be a little busy. Not sure yet. But I will put up a, another uh, advert, another advert, another <laughs> event on Facebook and let you know. So um, if you're not following me on Facebook or um, on Patreon, please do do that. Uh, you can also um, find my podcasts on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, basically wherever you get your Google, Amazon, whatever, wherever you get your podcast fix, that's where I'm found. Um, so please do uh, follow that. Give me some nice thumbs up and because uh, all of all of any reviews and any positivity you get to give me get, increases my organic search rankings, which is always lovely. Um, and if you're not already a patron, please do uh, consider going over to patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit uh, and sign up to be a patron from as little as five dollars a month for lots of other goodies also i'm thinking about doing a merchants uh, merch merch merchandise shop i'm um, working on that at the moment uh, sort of with bearded wit and readings and all sorts of stuff associated with that but i'll keep you posted on that um but yeah as i say follow me like me uh, on facebook and uh, instagram and wherever uh, and i will see you all very probably same place same time next week have really good evenings. Look after yourselves if you're in the heat uh, in in Europe. Be really careful. Look after yourselves. Look after yourselves if you're in the cold of the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, but, just, but just, you know, just do whatever it is you've got to do uh, to stay safe. Thanks ever so much for joining me this evening. Lovely to see you, everybody, uh, and see you again soon. Take care. <laughs>